We didn't find many breakfast spots around Newfoundland, so when we got the opportunity, we took it. Mifflin's in Bonavista was the closest thing to home cooking that we've had. After breakfast, we headed over to Dungeons Provincial Park. These unique sea caves were a result of collapsed sea caves over the years that have been washed out. This is one of those times we wish we brought our blow-up kayak. This was a beautiful way to start the day. We're able to do this trip with amazing partners like Xventure Trailers, Red Arc Electronics, and supported by Power Tube TV and Rugged Bound Supply Company. Just a quick five minute drive found us at John Cable's Cove. This cove has some pretty unique rock features, including a chimney. We found out it also has a pretty extensive puffin colony. And for the first time out in the bay, we saw a mom with her calf. It's pretty hard to believe after seeing the size of these humpback whales that orcas actually hunt these. If we had a few extra days, these are the areas that we'd like to have stayed and camped in. While talking with some locals, they told us the best place to see Puffin, well, reasonably up close, is in Elliston. A 10 minute hike and you're at the cliffs across from an island completely covered in Puffin. We sat and watched these goofy little birds try to fly for about half an hour. Another place we heard everybody talking about was a small town called Trinity. Trinity has a rich history with lots of tourism. A lot of the buildings are preserved and you can take tours of them. The one we were most interested in was the Green Family Forge, an active blacksmithing forge where you can see how it was done back in the old days. The Green Family practiced as blacksmiths in Trinity since before 1750. In 1991, the forge was restored and opened as a museum. When we were there, they actually were building a new forge. We got some demonstrations on how the bellows work, picked up a few hand forged items, and got on our way. Heading southeast, we took the foggy land bridge from the mainland of Newfoundland over to the St. John's area. Our destination is a uniquely named town of Dildo. Dildo sits on Conception Bay next to the town of Spread Eagle. You can't make these things up. Jimmy Kimmel even erected <coughs> a Dildo sign like the Hollywood sign above the town. Our first stop is Dildo Brewing. This place had a ton of fellow van lifers and other overlanders, and a huge selection of beers. We took a seat overlooking the bay, had a few sour beers of course, and enjoyed a quick afternoon lunch.
Our camp spot for the night would be northwest of town in a beautiful spot called Anderson Cove. This little area is a great example of why we love having a four-wheel drive vehicle while overlanding. Down the beach, it was pretty packed, full of vans and other campers. This area here, they couldn't get through because they didn't have four-wheel drive or high clearance. So we were able to have this whole end of our beach in the cove to ourselves. The area wasn't level enough to have everything level, but we got the trailer pretty close. Renee took the dogs for a walk while I set up camp. I'm not sure how we keep getting so lucky finding these amazing spots. Shortly after setting up, the wind picked up and it was starting to get chilly off the water. But we put the lava box upwind and all that heat was blasting us. With some dildo beer, an amazing view of the bay, we sat and watched the fishing boats do their thing. We love the name of this boat. Right at sunset, the wind died down and we got one of the best sunsets of the trip. It even seemed like Bibby was contemplating life and how wonderful it is to be here. Having a trailer so short and nimble makes it easy to get out of these tight spaces. Having a water tank that sits just above our axle on the trailer also helps to keep the bounce down and the center of gravity down lower. Time to head to the biggest city on Newfoundland Island, the city of St. John's. But first, we have one stop to make. Our DJI Mavic 3 Pro loves to eat through memory cards. And on this trip, so far, 10 64 gig cards. There you memory hungry jerk. Our first stop in St. John's is Signal Hill. Once you reach the parking lot at the top, there's hiking trails that go all over the coastline and amazing views of St. John City itself. Prominently perched at the very top is the Cabot Tower. In 1901, this tower received the first transatlantic wireless message from the United Kingdom across the ocean. And during the Second World War, this was a lookout for the town sporting some pretty big guns. And if you're lucky enough to get there around noon, this three pound Hodgkins gun gets shot off to signal noon to the town. You're even able to take the narrow stairs all the way up to the roof to get even a better view. St. John is also the launch site for the rescues that attempted to go find the Titanic sub that went down. Our next stop is one that I've been looking forward to way before we even started this trip. It's a little brewery called Quitty Vitty Brewery. This is probably the most well-known and visited brewery in Newfoundland. The variety of beers these guys have made over the years is staggering. But there's one beer in particular that I'm excited about. Iceberg beer. Literally made 
from the melted veins of that blue ice we saw earlier, this is the one beer that I wanted to try. Renee and I got a couple flights, you know, mostly sours of course, and stocked up with just a couple beers to bring back to Kentucky. Next stop is an area in Newfoundland called Jelly Bean Row, where a lot of the houses are painted in bright alternating colors. We have one more stop in downtown Newfoundland before we get out of here, and that is to get screeched in. And we've heard there's only one place to do that, Trapper John's. The act of getting screeched in is the most tourism way to become an official Newfoundlander. And the individual to do that job was named Trapper Bobby. Trapper Bobby is the squirrely bartender who's going to perform this little ritual for us. Listen closely because the accents are thick here. Pay attention closely and follow along on this unique experience on becoming a Newfoundlander. And excuse Trapper Bobby's shaky hands. So guys, welcome to Trapper John's. My name's Trapper Bobby. Guys, it's going to be my honor to make you guys members of Trapper John's in Newfoundland. What's your name? Where are you from? What brings you here? Jeremiah, Kentucky, and to do this crap. It's about time. <laughs> <laughs> Renee, Kentucky, and to get screeched in. So guys, there's four things I'm going to get you all to do. I'm going to get you all to drink something from Newfoundland, eat something from Newfoundland, say something from Newfoundland, and kiss something from Newfoundland. Don't oh. get your hopes up. You're not kissing me, all right? <laughs> so guys, to get this started, I'm going to ask you a simple question. And you're going to reply with a loud and proud with yes, bye. Are you screechers? Yes, yes, so guys, now I'm going to get you all to enjoy a bit of Newfie steak. Guys, last year, all Smith Landers, we managed to consume almost 8 million pounds of this stuff last year. Help yourself. Yeah. They're the highest consumers of this stuff on the planet. Eat up. You guys got any idea what you're eating? Hot dog. No. no. Bologna. Bologna. Yeah. So guys, you all got one ounce of Newfoundland Screech. I'm going to tell you all a little story where it came from. So it might taste a little bit better by the time you get to drink it. Whatever I say, this isn't going to make it taste better. So us Newfoundlanders, we used to have a lot of codfish years ago. Jamaica used to have a shitload of rum. So we used to trade our salt fish for it. But back then, we used to get the sludge in the bottom of the barrels. Us Snoofies, we scraped it off with razor blades and we boiled it up. And that's what we ended up with. So good luck with it. <laughs> so guys, on the count of three, you it? on the count of three, guys, down the hatch. One, two, three. Mm. So guys, now that I know you can somewhat drink like us, I want to know if you can talk like us. It's only 14 words long. The longest word has four letters. I'm only going to say it once, so good luck. <laughs> Indeed I is me old cock. Indeed I is me old cock. Me old cock, not my old cock. And long may your big jib draw. And, and long may your, your big jib draw. It's close enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Guys, have you got any idea what you just said? Nope. No yeah. idea. Good. <laughs> <laughs> have you got any idea what cock would be referred to in that phrase means? Rooster? It's better than what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> have you got any idea what a jib is? Something on a ship? Something on a sailboat? So us Newfoundlanders, we refer to one another as a cock as a good friend. If my buddy walked in that door right now, I'd say, what are you at, me old cock? Every Newfoundlander says it still to today. Me old cock means a good friend or an old friend. Jib, jib is proud that holds up a sail on a ship. So basically what we all just said was, wherever you go, wherever you may travel, may you have a good smooth trip, my buddy. Mm. Indeed I is me old cock. Indeed I is me buddy. And long may a big jib draw. May you have good sails upon your wind. Mm. So guys, I got you to eat something, drink something, say something. Oh, yes. uh, I'm sure you guys all kiss worse. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bring it. You got that tail on. <laughs> so, guys, congratulations. Guys, you're over 150,000 people that smell like fish. For the last part, we signed the wall of the bar and headed out to our camp spot. 40 minutes north of town, we found ourselves getting some pinstripes the Newfoundland way.
not caring about pinstripes will also get you to some amazing spots. These are the highest cliffs that we will camp on, over 600 feet. The cliffs above Redhead Cove are daunting. The wind being over 45 miles per hour, I put a couple legs down on the awning just for good measures. It was getting pretty chilly and even more windy, so Renee went ahead and got off in the tent. Just before closing down everything for the night and getting up myself, we had a couple camp visitors. A local police officer and a local fireman out for an afternoon ride. They hung out for about an hour. We talked about the difference between the United States and Canada. It's these small interactions that remind us that Canada is the best place to visit. Sleeping was made interesting by the extreme winds. We were able to pack up our tent and get on the road right as the rain hit. And lucky for us, we had Nora to save us from all the evil trees. Our first destination of the day is something that we can check off our geographical bucket list. Cape Spear is the easternmost point of Canada and North America. There's an awesome museum documenting the multiple lighthouses that have been erected over the years here. And a short walk down from the parking lot is the most easterly point that you can get to. Cape Spear being a significant geographical location also was the home of a World War II bunker that housed a couple massive guns that would pop out of the ground and launch a 10 inch mortar 2400 yards out into the ocean. Heading south along the coast through small harbor fishing towns and water pipelines to reservoirs, our second to last day looked like it was going to be straight rain. Our next stop was a town called Fairyland. We were looking forward to a hot meal at the Tetley Tea Room. This place was surprisingly busy until we learned that there was a dinner theater next door. So we dried off in a quiet corner with a hot meal. During our meal, the rain finally subsided revealing a foggy, mysterious coastline, full of jagged rocks covered in seagulls. This was yet another town with small community gardens on the outliers. To our relief, the further south we went, the clearer the skies got. We had now entered a very unique area of Newfoundland, the South Avalon Burren Oceanic Barrens. Our first stop in the Barrens is the Chance Cove Provincial Park. This park has one road in and one road out. And at the end of it, a campground next to a berm, and on the other side of the berm, is a view of the bay with a bunch of tiny little heads popping out. There were 20 or 30 seals there going after Kaplan that had schooled against the coast so tightly they were washing up on shore. I could have stayed there for most of the day, but the bugs were the worst that we have encountered in Newfoundland. Within 20 minutes, we had whelps all over us. As we head to our last camp spot on this trip in Newfoundland, we see an unrecognizable sight. Our first look at a churning Atlantic. Everywhere else we've been, the ocean was calm. These are the oceanic views that we thought we'd be getting everywhere else. 
the deep blue ocean that we've been seeing for weeks return to turquoise against the flat layered rock and sea caves. Other areas remind us of Scottish coastlines. Barrens are an understatement. There are no trees to be found anywhere. Driving along this U-shaped coast, you pass through endless meadows full of small ponds. There was also a unique scene where the fog seemed to just hang right off the shoreline. Cape Race, the southeast tip of Newfoundland, has long been an important navigational point. Vessels bound from North America to England the Cape was often their first landfall. This is also where the first Titanic May Day was received. Sitting here watching the waters churn were both beautiful and humbling. Before settling in next to the lighthouse to camp for the night, we decided to explore some local trails. We couldn't have found a better place to do some trail riding than among these windswept grass plains that seemingly fall off into the Atlantic. This long forgotten about gravel trail that we are on eventually would lead all the way back up to the Chance Cove Provincial Park. But being alone, it wouldn't be a smart choice to attempt it. We can't help but look in the distance and wonder what kind of an adventure it would be to try to get all the way up it. For now, we'll have to be satisfied with blue water coves and small dark tannin streams flowing into the ocean. getting later in the afternoon when we make it back to the lighthouse and the wind and waves are starting to pick up. Upon arriving and making camp, we are anxious to try an $18 bottle of iceberg water. This better be good. Having checked the weather earlier, it was supposed to be clear the whole night. But 30 minutes after setting up camp, one of the thickest fogs we have ever seen blocked out the sun.
And since we were planning on clear weather, we completely forgot about the foghorn that we were camped directly next to. Not wanting to hear that the rest of the night, we quickly packed up and moved down the coast about a mile and a half, where we found a sheltered little seal-filled cove. This place was straight out of The Hobbit. The day's landscapes changed from cliff lines to foggy coast to beautiful clear skies along barren landscapes and hectic Atlantic oceans and ending in a misty cove. We're feeling pretty lucky to be here. It's morning on our last day. An hour of horribly paved road turns us south one more time to the furthest south point that you can get a vehicle to. We're heading to the Cape Pine Lighthouse. Most lighthouses around Newfoundland have been automated, which means the homes around them were sold off to private landowners. So upon arriving at this house, we were greeted by a family just hanging out for a few weeks there. And in true Canadian fashion, they invited us up for coffee. When we say that everybody that we meet in Canada are nice, we aren't exaggerating. Every encounter is like a faith in humanity resort situation. Thanks guys for the hospitality. We have to be in the port of Argentia around 3 p.m. So having to rush out of there, we get on the road by 10.30. What we didn't realize or take into account was Route 91, that was a shortcut across the country, was all gravel and slowed us down just a bit. Our last stop before getting on the ferry was Castle Hill. The fort more consists of the remains of a fort that the British and French left behind. And with permission of the park, we were able to get a bird's eye view of the waters and towns these forts used to protect. Oh, what it would be like to lob a cannonball out into the ocean. You're supposed to arrive two hours early before departure of the ferries. We arrived three and a half to four. We wanted time for a complete reset before our journey home to Kentucky. We pulled out everything, even the mattress. All the fog and rain had left everything just a bit damp. And as luck would have it, as soon as we packed up, the fog rolled in. 4.45 and it's time to board the vessel. This vessel's name is the MV Atlantic Vision. And it's even bigger than the last one. This time, we were lucky to catch the elevator so we didn't have to carry the pups up eight flights of stairs. We book these overnight, so we are always traveling even when we're sleeping. No time wasted on these trips. The cabins did cost a pretty good amount, but they're completely worth getting a full night's rest. This Atlantic crossing is also 17 hours long and also so happens to be our anniversary. So we leave the dogs in the room and head out to the nicest restaurant on the boat to have an anniversary dinner. It's steak and potato for us. And just like on the last boat, if you didn't book a cabin way in advance, you were stuck hanging out in these chairs with everybody else for 17 hours. 
This overnight voyage covers 330 miles, putting us back into the port of Sydney, Nova Scotia. Waking up at 9 a.m. in our luxury cabin, we got packed and got ready to leave the room as soon as they announced we can go back to our cars because it is again a madhouse bum rush. We were able to be the first on the elevators and got in their truck. Goodbye and thank you Newfoundland. We had previously aired down to 26 PSI at the turnoff to Bay of Fundy. So before hitting the highway, we aired back up. Turn our shocks back to hard. And to get rid of extra weight, we empty all the water out of our trailer. It's an eight hour drive to the US border, crossing through Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, Canada. And of course, our trip wouldn't be complete without a surly and salty border crossing interrogation. And one last lobster roll. And in my case, two. This is a trip that will not easily be beaten. Thank you, Newfoundland. We will see you again one day.